Knowledge for Men, Episode 1. Welcome to KnowledgeForMen.com, interviewing the most successful and inspiring people to give you real-world advice to rise above the odds, live a life of purpose, reach your full potential, and become the man you were born to be. And now, your host, Andrew Farabee. All right, guys, welcome to the show. This is Andrew Farabee, the founder of KnowledgeForMen.com. It's been an incredible journey. In the last six months, I've had over 500,000 visitors to my website. And who would have thought that one simple idea would change thousands of lives? You see, this website, this movement, it's about helping people live better. It's about helping people reach their full potential. It's about helping people do the things they never thought they could do before. It's about getting the life you've always dreamed of. It's about helping guys become the man they want to become so deep down inside. You see, when I was depressed, when I was having relationship problems, when I couldn't talk to girls, when I was broke, when I hated my job, when I was an alcoholic, when I didn't even know who I was, I was searching for years. I was searching for that men's website that could help me that I could connect with, that could show me the way, but I couldn't find it. All I found were men's websites that just glamorize half-naked women and they don't give you any content that helps you. It's just mind-numbing content. So that's when I decided to just take it upon myself and build knowledgeformen.com. I introduce you to the podcast where I'm going to be interviewing the most influential and successful and inspiring people to give you the real world practical advice that's going to help you rise above mediocrity and become the man that you want to become. I'm interviewing health experts, dating coaches, relationship coaches, entrepreneurs, authors, motivational speakers, and personal growth experts, all for the sole purpose of helping you live the greatest life possible. And that's where you come in. If you like what I'm doing and you support this movement of helping men live better by interviewing the most successful people out there who have already gotten the results and are sharing their journeys on the Knowledge for Men podcast, then help share this podcast. Subscribe. Give it a positive review on iTunes. Help it grow so that we can impact and inspire millions of lives and get more people involved in this movement to ultimately help people live better. And without further ado, I'm happy to introduce the first guest of the first ever Knowledge for Men podcast, Hal Elrod. At age 20, Hal was hit head on by a drunk driver at 70 miles per hour. He broke 11 bones and was found dead at the scene. And his parents were told by doctors that if Hal ever came out of his coma, He had permanent brain damage and may never walk again. After six days in a coma, not only did he walk, he became an ultra marathon runner, Hall of Fame business achiever, international keynote speaker, success coach, hip hop artist, and multiple time number one best selling author of The Miracle Morning and Taking Life Head On, two of the highest rated and most acclaimed books on Amazon.com. Hal, I am so happy to have you on the show. I'm honored. I uh, I love I love your blog. And once you reached out and I checked out the blog, I was like, this is good. Like this is one of I actually emailed it to like all my friends. I was like, guys, check this out. This is one of the coolest blogs. Awesome. Thanks for the support, Hal. Now, if we could start off the show with a favorite success quote of yours and why. The success quote that I live by, uh, there's really two. I'll save one for later. And uh, the, the the first one is actually my own. And it's love the life you have while you create the life of your dreams. And that was after my first my car accident, which we'll talk about in my book. That was really what became my like my life purpose is to learn how to love my life even in the midst of challenges and adversity and you know things not going perfectly and to really actively create the life of my dreams and then inspire other people to love the life that they have while they create the life of their dreams. How what a great quote. That's so important that people are actually living life instead of planning their life and hoping that one day it's going to be better instead of waiting till they reach that goal, but actually living and enjoying that journey. That is so important. How now it's time to dig deep. Can you share with us your journey? Can you share us your story? And all the things that you've gone through, the challenges and the lessons that you've learned. I'll start back real quick. Uh, when I was 15 years old is when I, 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 my first dream started to be a radio disc jockey. And I got a job at a local radio station. And uh, I, my mom drove me down to the interview. I was only 15, got the job. And the radio station manager said, Hal, 
come up with a cool nickname for the air, you know, a cool DJ nickname to use. And I got all stressed out thinking, what the heck am I going to call myself? I don't have a cool nickname. And I got back in the car and mom said, why don't you rhyme it with Hal? Be like my pal Hal or your pal Hal or yo pal Hal. I said, mom, you're such a dork. I'm never going to be yo pal Hal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you look, I mean, this, you know, the, the, it graces the cover of my, of my book, uh, Taking Life It On. And it's my website, yo pal Hal.com. So mom is always right. You know, that's that first lesson to learn that mom is always right. And, and be open-minded to, to something that somebody else could teach you because you never know when it could change your life. Fast forward four years, I gave up my dream job on the radio to start in sales. And I started selling Cutco cutlery. You ever heard of Cutco before, Andrew? Yes. Yeah. Mo most people have right there. They sold it in college. Yeah. Uh, my, my buddy sold it. And uh, I, you know, he, he told me I should give it a shot. I thought I'm not a salesman. I'm a DJ. You know, I had a radio job. At that time, I ended up deciding to give it a shot. And 10 days into the job, I had sold more Cutco than anyone in 55 years of the, the company being in existence. And it was really like my entire life, I think it's really important. I was mediocre. Like I was the mediocre kid. You know, I didn't get great grades. I wasn't that popular. I didn't do extracurricular activities. You know, like I, I you know, the only thing my parents had to put on the fridge was like detention slips. There was no like awards or anything to be proud of. <laughs> and so a lifetime of mediocrity. And it really did teach me that that quote from Anthony Robbins is true. Our moments of destiny are shaped in our moments of decision. Something like that. Your moments of decision shape your destiny. It was it was in my Cutco training when I decided I want to break this record and do something that's never been done before. I didn't even know where, where I got that, the thought that I could do that, the belief that I could do that. But I thought, you know what, if somebody else could sell X amount of Cutco, which the record was $12,000 at that time, in their first 10 days, why not me? Why can't I go out and, and, and break it? And I sold $15,000 in, in my first 10 days. And so that kind of launched me into like a new level of belief, like that I could achieve anything that I really commit myself to. And a year and a half later, I had been asked to give a speech at almost every Cutco conference because I was the top salesperson, one of the top salespeople. A year and a half later, my new dream was to be a motivational speaker. I thought I'm going to be like the top Cutco guy and I want to be in the Hall of Fame. And then once I accomplished that, then I'm going to, I want to, you know, go on to be like the next Tony Robbins. Uh, coming home one night after giving a speech a year and a half later, I was 20 years old. A man I had never met before, a drunk driver, actually crossed over the center divide, hit me head on at 70 miles an hour, sent my car into oncoming traffic, and the car behind me hit me in the door at 70 miles an hour. And I actually broke 11 bones and I was dead for six minutes. Wow. And my parents were told by doctors that if I ever came out of my coma, I would probably never walk again and I could be a vegetable for the rest of my life. And six days later, I came out of the coma and had to face what was, you know, an unimaginable reality, really faced with the choice that we all have in adversity, which is like, am I going to be a victim and feel sorry for myself? Or am I going to, you know, learn from this and, and overcome this and be stronger as a result uh, of overcoming the challenge? I took the second route and I just decided, hey, I can't change it. There's no point in feeling sorry for myself. Doctors, though, said I would never walk again. And I told my parents, you know, the doctors might be experts in medicine, but they're not experts in me. You know, I said, Mom and Dad, I don't know why, but I got this intuition. Like, I have faith. I'm going to walk again. Call it the power of positive thinking. But three weeks later, not only, you know, did I walk again, I took my first step in three weeks. And, and doctors were baffled. They're like, we don't know how to explain how your body is healing so fast. But they came back with x-rays. They said, we're going to let you walk. The doc, it's funny, funny story. The doctor thought I was in denial. They actually called my parents in two weeks after the accident. So this was before I took my first step or even knew if I ever would. And the doctors called my parents in. They said, Mr. and Mrs. Elrod, we're really concerned with Hal. We believe he's in denial because every time we're around your son, he's always smiling and laughing and making us laugh. And that's not normal. They said, <laughs> not for someone that's been through what he's been through and doesn't know if he's ever going to walk again. He should be depressed and he should be sad and he should be angry that this happened to him. So we think he he can't handle it. So we this happens sometimes where accident victims just they, they just go into a fantasy world, right? And they just pretend everything's okay, nothing happened, and then they just, you know, and then eventually they said, they said it catches up with them and he has to face it. And that could lead to suicide, it could lead to drugs, it could lead to who knows what. They said, so we gotta get him to admit how he's really feeling here in the hospital where it's safe. So my dad came in that night and he said, Hal, he didn't tell me about the, the conversation. He just said, Hal. How are you feeling, buddy? I said, I'm fine, dad. Why? You know, you look so serious right now. He said, well, I know when your friends are here, you're laughing and you're reminiscing and you're telling stories. He said, but 
you know, when they leave and when the lights go out at night and when we're not here to, you know, to keep you company, how are you really feeling? Like, are, are you, are you sad? Are you, are you depressed? Are you angry that this happened? God knows your mom and I want to kill that drunk driver. Uh, so how are you feeling? And I could tell my dad was like, like trying to hold back tears. Like he was really concerned. So I really thought about his questions. And am I, am I sad? Am I depressed? Am I angry? And I just shook it off. And I looked at him. I said, dad, I thought you knew me better than that. I live my life by the five minute rule, which says it's okay to be negative. Sometimes when things go wrong, they don't go your way. You can complain, you can bitch, moan, vent, whatever you got to do, but you literally set the timer for five minutes. And after five minutes, you, you, you accept whatever has happened that you can no longer go back in time and change. And you focus 100% on where you are, where you want to go, and what's in your control to close that gap. I said, Dad, it's been more than five minutes. It's been two weeks. You know, I said, I can't change this. So there's no point in feeling bad about it. I said, I, you know, and, and I, I told my dad, I, and I made a joke, but it was serious when I said, Dad, I always want to be a motivational speaker, but I never had anything to talk about. <laughs> You know, I, I would have never wished for this, but maybe that's why, you know, the doctors, you know, he, my parents went back to the doctors and they told him he's, we're, he's really okay. And what the doctors didn't realize, and this is an important lesson for everybody listening, is it wasn't that I was pretending to be happy because I couldn't accept it. It was the exact opposite. I was genuinely happy because I had fully accepted it. And whatever it is in your life, that whether it's from your past or you're currently dealing with it, that's causing you negative emotions, negative emotional pain, whether it's regret or anxiety or anger, realize that it's, it's your resistance to something that is out of your control, whether it's the past, the present, or the future. If you accept life as it is, it doesn't mean you're happy when things go wrong, but more powerful than that. It means you're at peace with things. That negative thing that happened in your past that you've, you've suffered over for decades or for years, you know, that breakup or whatever, it's the moment you decide, you know what, I can't change it. I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to fully accept it. And now it loses its power over me. Now I'm at peace with it and I can move, I can focus on what's in my control. And so that's what I did. And I took my first step three weeks later. I went back to work against the doctor's orders. I, I actually won a sales trophy like seven days out of the hospital uh, with my parents driving me to my appointments. And, you know, that was my road to recovery. I, I went on to eventually, you know, do all the other things that you mentioned in my bio that wrote, you know, my first book, my second book, et cetera. Hal, what an inspiring story and what a tragedy that you've experienced. But it does leave me with one question. How are you able to accept the circumstances that you've been dealt with? It seems like you've been able to cope with this and handle this so well. Yeah, it's definitely easier said than done, right? And, and I teach this lesson when I, whenever I'm giving a speech, it's one of the most important lessons I teach. I, I call it the can't change it philosophy. Those are the three words, can't change it, right? Those are the three words that, um, that for me made the biggest difference. And yeah, at first I was, I was confused. I was scared. I was questioning things like, you know, I mean, it was, it, it, I was kind of a mess, but it really, it's interesting. It was almost, and I, I don't remember the first few days of waking up. I just know that from what my parents have told me, like I don't actually, because of the brain damage, I don't remember about five minutes before the crash. And I don't remember about a week after the, or two weeks after, well, the first week was a coma. So six or seven days out of the coma. I, there's a two week span in my life that's just gone. I don't remember. But from what my parents told me, I was positive from the mo almost the moment I came out of my coma. They said the first day, you know, I was confused and I was scared and I'd fall asleep and I'd wake back up. And because of the brain damage, I had no short term memory. So my parents would have to report poor, poor, my poor parents had it worse. They'd have to retell my story over and over to me of why I was in a hospital and what had happened to me and look at the expression on my face of going like just disbelief. But after, you know, a few days of kind of like processing it, I really almost immediately, I remembered that five minute rule, I think. And, you know, my parents said that from the beginning, I was back to just, you know, I was focused on being funny and laughing and joking. And part of that might've been the brain damage that I wasn't thinking clearly, <laughs> but, but ultimately I, my, my philosophy has gotten from the five minute rule, which again, I learned that in my sales training when he just, you know, the, the, the context that was taught in was look in life, you know, in, in, in your sales career, just like in life. You're going to have rejection. You're going to have failure. You're going to have missed expectations. You're going to have things not go your way. You're going to set goals and not reach them. The only effective response to that is to accept it and move on, right? And most human beings, they don't get that. Like, great example is traffic. 
you know, if you think about this, think about traffic, you're sitting in traffic. Let's say you left the house late, then you hit traffic that's bumper to bumper and you're, you're going to be in trouble for being late. There's some consequence from your employer or your, you know, your teacher or whatever. So think about, I love this analogy because this actually shows all of life, how we respond and how we resist the past, present, and future and create pain for ourselves. We, you focus on, oh, why did I leave the house late? Oh, I'm so frustrated with myself, right? Let me ask you a question, Andrew. Does getting frustrated with yourself about when you left the house somehow take you back in time and change the time you left the house? No. No. So when you think about it as an intelligent human being, now that we have that awareness, you go, you know what? It doesn't make sense to wish I had left the house earlier or be frustrated that I didn't leave on time because it doesn't change anything. And then we're frustrated with the, the pace of the cars in front of us. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gotten frustrated enough that it sped up the cars in front of you when you're in traffic? No. No, right? So we create emotional pain over the present that we can't change by wishing it were different and the past that we can't change by wishing it had been different. And then we worry about the future, which is out of our control, right? Not saying the future in general is out of our control. I'm saying, though, the aspects that are out of our control, like this person may do this or say this. This may or may not happen. I shouldn't fly on a plane because it may go, it may crash, right? All these things out of our control, and we create emotional pain in the form of anxiety, worry, fear over things that are out of our control in the future. So I love that analogy because we're creating emotional pain every day over big or little things from the past that we can't change, the present and the future that we can't change. But if you just get in that car, right, and you go, you know what? I can't change it. The only logical, intelligent choice I have is to enjoy the ride. And that's really the analogy for life. You can't change the past. The things in the, like, you can't change the economy today. You can't change your bank account balance necessarily. Like, I'm not saying you can't change your life. Yes, you can change your life. That I'm all about that. But there are certain things that you can't change. And you've got to accept those and focus on the things that you can change. Hal, what an interesting point that you bring up. You can't control the past. You can't control the future. All you can do is control the present. You can control the actions that you take in the now. Now, I want to ask you, when was your major aha moment when you realized that you can control the present and that it's all that you have control over really? Yeah, the you know when I was in the hospital and I remembered the whole, the whole five-minute rule, I thought, oh, wait a minute, I can't change the accident. So the only thing that makes sense is to focus on what I can change. And then, you know, and I, I had vaguely dabbled in personal development up until that point. And so I learned a little about the power of positive thinking. And I learned, you know, I, I heard about the mind body connection, you know, and, and now that I know is, you know, so much more, I, I realize. in fact, I was interviewed by these medical doctors the other day that really focused on quantum physics. And I was sharing my story. And they, they were like, you don't even realize that you healed your body. The reason you were able to walk in three weeks is because you believed that you could. And you literally, they, they talked about, how, you know, I don't know the scientific mumbo jumbo, but how I affected my cells, right? And I literally was able to heal my own, own body. So for me in the hospital, it just it just came with that realization of the five minute rule. Uh, there's no point in feeling bad about this longer than, you know, than I already have, you know, so I might as well focus on what I can control. And then I started, you know, focusing on every day for me, it was therapy. I went to therapy every day and I was like, let's do extra therapy. Like I'm going to, you know, I was just super positive in therapy and like, I'm going to walk and they would tell me like, Hey, I would like push myself to go a little further than they, than they said was okay. I was always pushing to try to be better and faster and stronger and, you know, and heal quicker. And I mean, you know, it obviously it, it paid off. Wow. The power of positive thinking is just so powerful. It can have such an effect on your body. That is such an inspiring story to hear. Now, before we dive deeper into the, some of the lessons learned, I do want to talk about the miracle morning. How did this book come to be? How did you write this? And, and where did this, all this information come from? Can you talk to us a little bit about the miracle morning? For about eight years, I literally was, I, I, I was not a morning person. I, I hit this, you know, I did what most Americans do, which is waste the morning. You know, successful people, I've found they know better. They wake up earlier than they have to, and they work on their goals, they work on their dreams, and they work on their personal development so they can become the person they need to be to achieve their goals and dreams. Whereas most Americans hit the snooze button until the last possible moment, they rush out the door, work all day, come home exhausted, eat food, watch TV, rinse and repeat. And literally that morning time when science has proven that our willpower is the strongest, they, they, it just goes to waste. You know, they're just, they're just snoozing through their, their, their potential. 
And so for me, that's what I did. And 2008, 2009, you know, fast forward, I had, I had, I, I had hit the hall of fame with my company. I had written my first book, taking life head on. And I had decided that I wanted to give back to other people. And after hiring a coach, you know, my life changed. I tripled my income, et cetera, et cetera, wrote my book. So I decided I want to be a coach. Like after I was coached for a year, I was like, this is what I want to do. Like my coach changed my life. I want to pay this forward. I want to be a coach. And then I want to be, you know, I was also a speaker as well. And so I had just launched, I had a really successful coaching business. I had a six figure coaching business and my speaking career and my, my book sales, all of that incorporated. And when the U.S. economy crashed in 2008, 2009, my business, my coaching clients were, were mostly salespeople, entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, financial advisors, people that were all affected by the economy, you know, the economic crash. So all of a sudden, when it came to on their end to do I pay the mortgage or do I pay Hal for coaching, right? It was like, Hal, I'm sorry to do this, but please, right? I got to get out of my coaching. So over half of my clients couldn't afford to pay for their coaching and I lost over half my income. And as a result, I lost my house. Um, I, I accumulated over $50,000 in credit card debt. And because my life was spiraling downward, just out of control, and it was getting worse day by day, it was getting worse and worse and worse, I got deeply depressed. And whenever I share my, my, my message or my story, you know, I talk about that I have two rock bottoms in my life that I've been fortunate enough to hit. The first one was the accident. And the second one was when my business crashed. And I always say the second was a lot worse than the first. And people always ask, wait, 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 how could, what's worse than dying? Like, I, I don't, I don't understand. How can it be lower than that? And I think the difference was this. When I, when I was woke up from my coma, the really the only place to go from there was up, right? It was like, I was going to, I was only going to heal. I was only going to get better. I was only going to, you know, my brain was going to get better. My body, it was going to only get better. And when, when the economy crashed, it was getting worse and worse and worse. Not to mention when I was in the hospital, I had like so much love and support from my friends and my family and the hospital staff. When, when the economy crashed, right, it was just me and my fiance, you know, kind of a struggling alone. And there was nobody there to, you know, to I didn't have nurses giving me sponge baths during the economic crash. You know, I didn't have people weren't bringing me food. And um, so I got really, really depressed. The turnaround came for me when I finally broke down and my, my fiance said, Hal, you've got to talk to somebody about this. Because keep in mind, because I was a success coach, I didn't want to tell anybody that I was failing, right? It was like, yeah, I was like totally winning against my identity. And I thought, oh, you know, what does that make me a fraud? And then I also believe in authenticity. So I felt like a fraud internally, like I'm you know, helping other people succeed, but I can't succeed. So I was just, I was mentally and emotionally a wreck. And finally, my fiance said, Hal, you've got to talk to one of your friends, you know, talk to John. John is successful. He's brilliant. Get some advice from him. And six, it was six months of, of being depressed and spiraling out of control, losing my house and all that. When I finally called John and I said, John, Hey man, I got to tell you what's going on. And I, I told him the whole thing and how bad things had gotten. And I, I, I was sitting there with my computer open and, and a blank word document titled John's advice, right? I was like, he's going to tell me something profound to turn my life around. And his advice, he asked me a question. He said, Hal, are you exercising every day? And I, I totally blew that off. I was like, what are you on your phone playing a game or something? Like, did you hear what I just told you? No, I'm not exercising every day. I can't even get to bed in the morning. But that's that's inconsequential. How am I going to turn my business around and turn my life around? And he was very serious with his question. He goes, Hal, if you're not exercising every day, you're not getting your blood flowing to your brain and oxygen to your brain and releasing those endorphins that will allow you to feel better and think clearer so that you can solve your own problems and turn your situation around. And I thought, I said, okay, but what else can I do? He goes, Hal, every day you need to go for a run. I said, John, I hate running. He said, what do you hate worse? Your situation? or running. I said, touche, man. I hate my situation. So the next morning I, I laced up my basketball shoes. I wasn't a runner. I didn't even own running shoes, right? Laced up my Air Jordans, headed out the front door with my iPod. And I heard a quote that completely changed my life two minutes into the run. And this is the quote I mentioned earlier. And the quote is from Jim Rohn. And to this day, this is one of the guiding philosophies of my life. And it's where the mir miracle morning was born from this quote. And the quote is this, your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development 
because success is something you attract by the person you become. And I literally stopped running, hit rewind, and listened to it again. And like the light shone down from heaven, and I had this realization, I'm not dedicating time to my personal development each day, at least not at the level I need to be. I'm not like really committed to it so that I can become the person that I need to be to create the life I want, to solve my problems, make more money, turn things around. And I ran home with a new level of commitment that I'm going to dedicate an hour a day to my personal development. And then I came up across two problems, two challenges. Number one, when am I going to find an hour in my schedule to do personal development? Like I, I wake up when I have to get ready for work. I work all day and then I'm exhausted. Like there's no time. And then I remembered something that one of my mentors said. If you want your life to be different, you have to be willing to do something different first. Kevin Bracey said that. And I looked at my schedule, the 5 a.m. hour just like stared back at me and I heard Kevin's quote in my head and I'm like, damn it, he's right. And I wrote 5 a.m. personal development because I already got up at 6 a.m. just like most Americans do because I had to. I had to be somewhere, do something, you to answer to someone. And 5 a.m. personal development, the second challenge was, okay, that scares the heck out of me in and of itself, but what am I going to do during that hour? So I started brainstorming and Googling and I wrote down six personal development practices that I had learned over the years from all the successful people, but I had never stuck to them, right? You know, meditate every day, journal every day, read positive affirmations, visualize, exercise, you know, all of these things. And then I had six practices written down. I had 60 minutes and I thought, all right, I'm going to do 10 minutes each tomorrow morning. And my entire life changed in that moment. And I didn't realize it because my bank account balance didn't change in that moment, right? But going back to the Tony Robbins quote, which I think I'm going to get this time, it's in our moments of decision that our destiny is shaped, that that moment of decision that I'd wake up the next morning and think about it, Andrew, right? Did I have to wake up the next morning, right? Like, was anybody holding me to that? No. no. And, no. but that was exactly why I realized, wow, if I, theoretically, if I wake up an hour early every day, and I dedicate myself to becoming the person that I need to be to create everything I want for my life, it kind of seems like theoretically, it's inevitable that I, my life will gradually get better and better and better. And if I focus on business, and I focus on developing myself in the area of business and accumulating wealth, then that area of my life will get better and better and better. Now, this was theory, but it had me optimistic. And I went from being deeply depressed for six months getting worse and worse and worse to for the first time almost immediately going I've got I've got hope I'm optimistic and the next morning when alarm clock went off at 5 a.m. as you know from reading the book I woke up and I it was like Christmas morning like I jumped out of bed and I ran into the living room and I I did all of the you know the journaling and the affirmations and the meditation and half of these things I didn't even know how to do I had to google how to meditate right I don't know how to do it but I just followed the steps and did it and by 6 a.m., I had I was more energized, motivated, inspired, positive than I had been I mean, in my entire life. And I realized, wow, if I do this every day, I, I can't help but create if I, you know, I realized that if you nail the first hour, the rest of the day follows that first hour. And most people's first hour is is either lethargic or chaotic or stressed or wasted on Facebook or watching the news or whatever. And I realized if I make myself mentally, physically, emotionally, and intellectually strong for the first hour of every day, I will be at my best to take my life head on. And within two months, I had doubled my income back to where it had been higher than it had been before the economic crash. I went from hating running to training for a 52-mile ultra marathon. And I went from being deeply depressed to being, at, I mean, literally at my physical and intellectual and emotional best. And I started teaching my coaching clients. And as you know, the rest is kind of history. There are literally now tens of thousands of people around the world. You know, there's a hundred. I just checked this morning because I'm kind of obsessed with checking. But there's 175 reviews on Amazon, most of which are five star and some four star that that say that the Miracle Morning has literally changed their life more than anything else they've ever done. And most of them say two things. Number one, I've read so many books this is the first one that actually made a measurable difference in my life. 
And number two, I was not a morning person when I read this book and I almost didn't buy it because of the thought of having to wake up early, you know, and, you know, but now I get up every day at, you know, 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. or or whatever it is. So that kind of brings us to where we are today. Now I'm just sharing the Miracle Morning and, you know, just amazed by the impact that it's having. Wow. How, what an incredible story. Thank you for sharing the Miracle Morning is really the real deal. It's added tremendous value into my own personal and professional life. My happiness levels, productivity levels, all around the board are just increasing. I notice it from the moment I started. Hal, we're going to now enter one of my favorite parts of the show. Get ready, guys. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guest will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in three, two. One showtime. What's the best advice you've ever received from a business mentor? To believe that you're capable of anything that you put your mind to and then commit. Commit 100% to going after a goal that challenges you, that scares you. And and, and it's going to be hard, but follow through. And that's what happened in my first 10 days of Cutco. That was the mentor. He said, Hal, I know you've never done this before. I know you're scared. I know you have no references to say you can accomplish this amazing goal. But if you commit and give it everything you have and just tell yourself it's possible, you know, that's when miracles are created. And I found that to be true in every area of life. I like that. Second question. What is your all-time favorite book? Conversations with God. And uh, it was the most, and it's a non-religious book, not, you know, but uh, it's just the most, it was the most eye-opening book. I was raised, you know, Catholic and uh, just lots of questions. And it was like every question I ever had about, about and it was very empowering. It wasn't about, yeah, I, I hesitate to always recommend that book because, you know, you, you get people have strong opinions one way or the other, but check it out. Conversations with God. I'll have to check that out right after the show. Now, third question, what's one action that someone can take today that will get them closer towards their dreams? Um, you know, I call these the ABCs, uh, or but they come backwards. There's a C and a B and an A. The C is for clarity. Literally, grab a piece of paper out right now. Grab your journal, open up a Word document, and get clear on few things. What do you really want for your life? Why do you want it? What's been holding you back from getting it? And what do you need to do now to move in the direction of achieving it? The B is for belief. You got to generate those belief in yourself that anything's possible. Find that place in yourself where anything is possible. And the A is for action, right? Just commit. What's the first thing you're going to do that'll move you in that direction? Clarity, belief, and action. That sounds like an amazing strategy. I want to put that to use in my own life. Now, to the next question. Here's a scenario for you. Imagine you have $1,000 and you were 20 again. What would you do? I would invest a thousand dollars into my personal development. I would probably, you know, get the Anthony Robbins, uh, you know, course. I'd buy, I'd buy some books. I'd um, and I, you know, I'd invest in some audio uh, training programs and video training programs. So you would take that thousand dollars and invest in yourself. I'd invest in myself. Yeah. Perfect. That sounds like a great idea. Now moving on. If you had to write your obituary today. What would you want it to say? Hal Elrod was somebody who focused on bringing out the best in others and, uh, and, and tried to live his life as an example of, of others. You know, what's possible for all of us when we believe in ourselves and work towards our dreams and overcome all of our fears, insecurities, and shortcomings. Because God knows I've got just as many as anybody else. And I'm it's constantly, you know, working on overcoming the things that have held me back or holding me back to continue to get better so that I can understand how to help other people do the same. That is just on the ball. It is so important to believe in yourself and just let go of all the past and shortcomings and just move forward. Now to the next question. What parting piece of guidance can you give the audience as they go on with their day today? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that everything we do in life, right, is really about, uh, it comes back to, to trying to be happy, right? You know, it's trying, everything comes down to, we want to feel good, right? Or feeling good is probably a better way of saying it. We want to feel good, whether that's happiness, gratitude, whatever it is. You want to feel good. You know, I mean, it's been taught for, for ages, but it's the idea that you've, you know, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way, but let me, let me give you a distinction that I think will help you do that. Every single one of us already has everything that we need to be the happiest person on earth. It is simply up to us to remember that in every moment. So think about that. Like you have everything that you need to be the happiest person on earth. And for, I really think that it boils down to gratitude. You know, the quality of our happiness, the quality of our life at any given moment is directly in proportion to the amount of gratitude that we are present to. There's a, there's infinite things to be grateful for in your life right now, 
But if you're not, if you're complaining instead of being grateful, in fact, there, one of my quotes is, you know, complaining and gratitude cannot coexist simultaneously. You have to choose to focus on the one that serves you. And that is gratitude. In life, we have two pages, right? One that lists all we have to be grateful for, one that lists all we have to feel bad about. And sadly, most people live on this page, right? They're focused on the bad page and they're focused on their faults, their shortcomings, their failures, their fears, their insecurities, the, the, the things in life that aren't going their way. And they focus on that. And when you focus on that, when you focus on the bad, you feel bad. Happy people don't necessarily have a shorter list on the bad page. They just live on the gratitude page. They're focused on all that they have to be grateful for, past, present, and future. All of the opportunities that they have to look forward to to be grateful for. And so I really believe that that's the parting wisdom is just to realize that, hey, smile, enjoy your life. If you're going through challenges right now, welcome to the club. And be grateful for your challenges because those are making you into the person that you need to be to create everything else that you want for your life. Your journey is never, ever smooth without obstacles. The obstacles are one of the most important components of your journey and of you creating that life that you want. How that is just so inspiring and so motivating for myself and for the listeners today. Before we come to a close, what are some things that excite you today? What are you working on today that really just gets you going? Yeah, good question. Um, so I really believe, and this is mostly comes from feedback from other people, that the Miracle Morning is the greatest gift that I have to give to the world. Like it's the thing that, you know, like my first book was, it taught you a lot of great philosophies and people incorporated it and they thought differently and it, you know, and it inspired them, it helped them. And I got great feedback in that way. The difference with the Miracle Morning is, Unlike most books where you're just thinking differently because you learn something new from it, and often you forget 98% of what you learn in a book, you read it and you feel better. You're like, wow, that was good. And hopefully you, you at least remember one thing from it that improves your life. What's unique about that Miracle Morning is that um, people are actually doing something different every day that is radically transforming their life. So I really believe the Miracle Morning is my greatest gift. And so because of that, not only am I focused on the book, which I told you earlier, I've got, you know, I've got a TV interview today and a radio interview and, you know, I'm putting it out there in any way I can. Uh, We started a series. And so the Miracle Morning for Realtors is being co-authored right now. The Miracle Morning for Salespeople is being co-authored right now. And uh, I I see this as a, like, kind of like the next chicken soup for the soul. I mean, we've got ideas for over a hundred titles and it's just a way of, of reaching different specific groups of people like the miracle morning for teachers will come out right so it's a way we're reaching teachers the unique thing about the book is it's not just rehashing the miracle morning only the first chapter teaches the miracle morning and then the other 10 chapters are based on interviews with people in the top one percent of their field so we're interviewing people what sales people in the top one percent of their company for the book and learning what they do to be successful. I call the not so obvious secrets to their success. And so the book is incorporating that. So anyway, so yeah, the series is something I'm really focused on. And then I do a lot of speaking. I mean, if anybody's listening to this and they need a a motivational, you know, either a keynote speaker for, or, or a sales trainer or anything, I do corporate stuff. I do high schools and colleges is where I'm really passionate about. Yeah. So a lot of speaking and then my, my wife and my kids going to Disneyland. That's probably my favorite part of my, uh, my day or week or life at this point. Hal, the future is just so bright for you. I can't wait to see all the books get released. I can't wait to see all the next seminars that you're doing, all the speaking events. I hope one day that I can see you in there too. Hal, go ahead and give yourself a plug so the audience can reach you in the future. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Um, uh, my personal website is yopalhal.com. That's Y-O-P-A-L-H-A-L.com to get you know all the info on everything I do, coaching, speaking, et cetera. But I'd love to give your listeners a free gift. Uh, if, if you are listening to this right now and you want to get two free chapters of The Miracle Morning, you know, for those that haven't already gone to Amazon and bought it because you couldn't wait, um, you can go to miraclemorning.com, miraclemorning.com, and you'll get what I call the Miracle Morning Crash Course, which is two free chapters of the book, a 15-minute video of me from the stage teaching the Miracle Morning, and a 60-minute in-depth audio training on the Miracle Morning. And that's all at MiracleMorning.com, all totally free. Thank you for sharing those gifts with the audience. Everybody go ahead and get that right now while it's still available. And Hal, I just want to thank you for being on the show and, and imparting all this valuable wisdom upon us. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, guys. Take care. And so there you have it our first podcast show for Knowledge for Men. And if you really like what we're doing and you want to see more guys like Hal get on the show and just really just 
pick their brains and, and help us understand how they did what they did. How did they succeed? How did they become who they become? Then give us a positive feedback on iTunes. Share this with your friends. Spread the word. We're on a mission here, guys. Let's work together. So before you go, check out knowledgeformen.com. I made a lot of stuff on there for you. I think you'll like it. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. Now, go crush the day, live better, take action, and get the life you've always dreamed of.